Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Finnegan's webcast, Implications of the U.S. Supreme Court's 2023 Decisions for Trademark and Copyright Owners. I'm Daniel Stringer, and I'll be your moderator today. It's my pleasure to welcome our presenters, Brett Hebner and Yinfei Wu. Brett Hebner is a partner based in Finnegan's Washington, D.C. office. With over 27 years experience, Brett's practice includes all aspects of trademark and unfair competition law, with a particular emphasis on trademark infringement, counterfeiting, false advertising, litigation, and trademark trial and appeal board litigation. Our co-presenter is Yinfei Wu, an associate based in our Washington, D.C. and Shanghai offices. Yinfei has significant experience in trademark, copyright, and advertising law in both the United States and China on matters ranging from trademark clearance, prosecution and portfolio management to litigation and enforcement matters. And I am Dan Stringer, an associate in Finnegan's Washington DC office, where I focus on trademark clearance, prosecution, portfolio management, enforcement and trademark and trademark trial and appeal board litigation. Before I turn things over to our presenters, I invite everyone to participate by submitting questions. This is an interactive webinar just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of the webcast interface and type your question into the Q&A window, then click Submit. You may enlarge the slide window at any time by clicking on the Enlarge Window button on the top right side of the slide window. The slides will advance automatically throughout the event. If you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please click on the webcast Help Guide button in the lower center of the webcast interface. For today's agenda, Brett will be discussing Abitron Austria GmbH versus Hetronic International Incorporated. Yin Fei will then discuss Jack Daniels Properties Incorporated versus VIP Products LLC. And then Brett will discuss our last case, Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts Incorporated versus Goldsmith. And now I'll turn it over to our presenters to begin our presentation. Welcome, Brett and Yin Fei. The floor is yours. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so the first case we're gonna be talking about today relates to the extraterritorial application of the Lanham Act. And it's um, uh, the first case that was decided this year, Arbitron Austria GmbH versus Hetronic International. So kind of the, the, the first question before we get into the facts of that case is what is extraterritoriality? Um, well, in, in, under US law, um, a law is presumed to only apply within the territories of the United States. So if it's a law passed by Congress or a state, it is not expected um, to apply outside the United States, except under certain circumstances. And of course, you know, the, the main reason for this is to avoid international discord, um, creating diplomatic problems, respecting the sovereignty of, of other countries. So traditionally, um, how do courts handle the question of extraterritoriality? That is, when a plaintiff brings a, a lawsuit, are they asking for an extraterritorial um, uh, application of U.S. law? And, you know, is that appropriate? So it's really a two-part inquiry. Um, the first part is that the, the court, the judge, will um, want the plaintiff to say whether or not the statute that they're going to be applying specifically states that it has an application outside the United States. Um, certain, there are certain situations where Congress um, has uh, specifically authorized a, a statute or a law to apply outside the United States. But if it doesn't, if the statute doesn't specifically address that, um, the question then is, does the dispute involve something that's really domestic in activities, or is it a foreign um, activity? Um, traditionally, that has involved something that's kind of like a, a, a loose kind of weighing um, uh, factor. Um, now, for trademarks, when the issue is how do you apply trademarks extraterritoriality, the focus is almost always going to be on this second factor, because the, the Trademark Act, the Lanham Act, um, is silent on extraterritoriality. It does not um, indicate that it is to apply outside the United States, which is to be expected since, you know, worldwide, um, trademarks are traditionally considered to be uh, territorial. So the first time the Supreme Court dealt with this 
was about 70 years ago in a case called Steele versus um, uh, Bull of a Watch Company. Um, and the facts of that case are really interesting. Uh, uh, Steele, who's actually the defendant in that case, was a U.S. citizen residing in San Antonio, Texas. He made watches. That was his. That was his business. And in the course of conducting his business, he discovered that the well-known Swiss slash U.S. watchmaker Bulova had not registered their trademark in Mexico. So Mr. Steele got this great idea that he was going to register the mark in uh, Mexico himself and transfer a part of his business to Mexico City. Um, to make watches there. Now he still continued to live in San Antonio and continued to manage and direct these Mexican operations from San Antonio. Uh, the way his scheme was set up is he would buy watch parts in the United States, he would put them together and he would ship the watch parts to Mexico where they would be assembled. And only in Mexico would the bull of a mark be actually applied to the watches that he made. Uh, Mr. Steele advertised um, his uh, uh, Bulova watches in, all around the Mexican-U.S. border. So the, the ads were seen and heard on both sides of the border, but he only sold them in Mexico. Um, he did not sell any watches in the United States. Um, he only had the, the, the fakes in these border towns near the U.S. border. Now, um, U.S. citizens... Uh, frequently cross the, the border between the United States and Mexico, in Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, and uh, like to do shopping there, that sort of thing. So it is not uh, uncommon at all for a U.S. citizen to purchase something like the Bull of a Watch in, in Mexico and then take it back to the United States. When they got back to the United States, uh, unsurprisingly, the Bull of a Watches needed repair. They were not as high quality as the real genuine Bull of a Watches. Um, and so when they brought them to watch repair shops in the United States, they were um, sad to, to learn that um, they were not real Bulova watches. Um, while this is going on, the actual Bulova company um, learned of Mr. Steele's um, Mexican trademark registration and got it canceled in Mexico. And that was kind of a key issue in the case because that takes out the, the notion that a U.S. court would somehow be violating Mexico's sovereignty if, if the Mexican registration were considered valid. So given that background, Bolova sued Steele in a, in a U.S. court in Texas. Um, that um, court um, sided completely with Bolova. It granted Bolova an injunction against Steele's production and infringing activities in, in Mexico. Um, Bolova was, Bolova was uh, awarded damages for infringing sales uh, that took place in Mexico. Now, Steele then said, well, I'm appealing this because all of my activities were in Mexico. And so this is an improper extraterritoriality. So when he got to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court actually affirmed the uh, extraterritorial application of the Lanham Act as uh, formulated by the Texas court. And their reasonings were, you know, Steele is a US citizen. The watch parts were purchased in the United States. They were shipped from the United States to Mexico. Steele um, kind of targeted U.S. citizens by um, advertising near border towns and placing his um, shops near border towns. Um, they also said consumers were confused in the United States and that Bulova suffered damage in the United States. So that was the Supreme Court's reasoning at that point in time. So now we fast forward 70 years to this year and the Arbitron Austria versus Hetronic case. And here, the U.S. Supreme Court sort of revisited this issue of extraterritorial application of the, the Lanham Act and um, uh, came up with a, a, a different kind of test and a different thought process. So here are the facts. Hetronic, which is based in Oklahoma, is the U.S. manufacturer of radio controllers for construction equipment. And Abitron was Hetronic's foreign distributor. Ab Abitron was based in Austria, and they had operations throughout Europe. Um, at some point in time, Abitron ended the relationship with Hetronic and instead then reverse engineered Hetronic's technology to make its own radio controllers. Um, now, in doing this, Abitron's um, engineering, design, manufacturing, all done in Europe. There was no, no activity in the United States at all. Um, Hetronic only owned trademark rights in the United States. They owned the word mark Hetronic, the logo 
this trade dress that you're seeing the yellow and black kind of combination, the product configuration, Hetronic, uh, is my understanding, did not register this in Europe. But as you can see from the photograph, um, Abitron made like slavish copies. They looked exactly like the Hetronic product. Um, now, Arbitron, Abitron apparently had believed that somehow some product development agreement gave them the rights to um, Hetronic's um, uh, intellectual property. And so they proceeded full steam ahead. And they were very successful. Abitron um, marketed, again, you know, almost ex exclusively in Europe. They sold $90 million worth of infringing products. 97% of that amount was purely in Europe. Um, there were some um, products that were sold to European consumers that ended up um, being taken back to the United States for use by those European companies. That was about a million dollars worth of products. Um, Abitron did not market in the United States. It did have a website that was accessible by US consumers, but you know, only a very, very small number of US consumers purchased and made direct sales. Um, it was about 100 to $200,000 in direct sales. So, you know, a very minuscule percentage of the overall sales were um, directly to the United States. So, um, Hetronic sued Abitron in Oklahoma for trademark infringement and they prevailed. Um, Hetronic's um, uh, relief was very broad ranging. They obtained a permanent injunction against Abitron, including all the activities that took place solely in Europe. Hetronic was awarded $97 million in damages and that was based on Abitron's worldwide sales. So Abitron appealed, um, again, arguing that this extraterritorial application of US trademark law was not appropriate. All, almost all of its activities and almost all of this relief was based on things that happened in Europe, not the United States. So that brought us to the Supreme Court. Um, and the Supreme Court said, look, we need to kind of have a clearer test about um, extraterritoriality. And the, the thought was, they said, is you've got to first determine whether the suit seeks a kind of a permissible ap domestic application with some foreign aspects to it or an impermissible foreign application of the, the trademark law. And to do this, there's a, a two-part test. First, what is the focus of the U.S. Trademark Act? And then second, did the conduct that's relevant to that act occur in the United States territory? Um, and if it did, then um, the court can um, enjoin it and, and issue damages. If it didn't, that would probably be an improper um, extraterritorial application of the U.S. law. Um, so how did that ap apply here? Um, the uh, Hetronic had argued that the Trademark Act's focus was protecting consumers and preventing consumer confusion, and there was consumer confusion in the United States, particularly with the goods that ended up through the stream of commerce coming back to the United States. Um, the court uh, disagreed and said, really, the focus of the trademark act, although it, consumer protection is part of it, is really um, stopping the infringing use of a trademark in US commerce. That's the focus, the stopping the infringement in US commerce. So the question is, did the infringing conduct occur in the United States? That is, did the actual copying of the trademark and sale of infringing products occur in US territory? And the answer was, was no, um, for much of what went on in the, in the Abitron, Abitron um, activities. The court specifically said instances of consumer confusion with the US are not sufficient standing alone for the application of US law to foreign conduct. So what that basically meant was Hetronic, you know, uh, unfortunately had their their relief essentially gutted. Um, the damage and the judgments were vacated because they covered worldwide world, worldwide sales of the Abitron um, products. Um, now the court did remand it for consideration of damages and injunction that would only relate to U.S. conduct. Within, within the United States. But of course that would primarily be these direct sales to the US, you know, which um, was a really, really small fraction of the, the amount of sales that um, Hetronic, uh, sorry, that Abitron had. So one lesson from, from this is, you know, maybe, you know, Hetronic should have 
registered its trademarks in Europe so they could show that it actually had rights and maybe then it should have sued in Europe rather than the United States. Um, I think that's something that you know a lot of US companies sometimes forget that there are significant markets outside the United States where you need to register your mark and be willing to litigate there. So I think, you know, looking kind of at the big picture, what does the Abitron decision mean? What is infringing conduct in the United States? Well, I mean, I think that's obviously going to be very fact-based. Um, but I think from looking at the Bulova case and looking at the Hitronic case, I, we should note that all the, although the court um, said the Bulova case um, was still good law, it did not overturn Bulova, it did say that the Bulova case was kind of, case was kind of unique for its facts. So I think looking at that, you know, we can say that, you know, purchasing parts in the United States for the infringing product may be enough, you know, for, for some sort of infringing conduct. Shipping the parts to create the infringing uh, product from the U.S. to a foreign assembly, maybe that's enough. Um, it's unclear, maybe advertising a foreign retail location in the United States um, for U.S. consumers might be enough. Um, it may even be like directing the foreign counterfeit scheme from your U.S. office. Like Mr. Steele was in San Antonio. Maybe that's enough. I think you, you need those sorts of things at the very least, probably, to get a, an injunction from the U.S. court for foreign activities. I think what we can clearly say from Hetronic, what's not enough, is if the products are sold abroad and just kind of wind their way into the United States. That seems like that's probably not enough. Certainly confusion... Um, in the United States based on sales that occurred completely outside of the United States is probably not enough. And you know, reputational harm to a US company based on activities outside the United States is also probably not gonna be enough. Um, so with that in mind, I I've put together some hypotheticals. So we're gonna be doing a, a, you know, a poll here based on what people think. Um, so here's a hypothetical. There's a, um, a German company that makes a handbag that's basically a knockoff of the famous coach designer bags. Spells coach a little differently, has kind of a similar C logo, um, but it does all this in, in Germany. It has no manufacturing in the United States, no direct sales in the United States. Um, but let's say that a, a, a US um, operator of a chain of boutiques comes to Germany and thinks, oh, this is a great bag. I'm gonna buy a whole bunch of them and bring them back to the US and sell them in my boutiques. So the question is, um, can Coach sue that German company under those circumstances for some sort of an injunction or damage? So I'm hoping people will take a few minutes here and um, fill out the, the poll question. We'll get some answers. So um, click your buttons with what you think, and let's see what, hopefully we'll get some, uh, some answers here. So people are saying, saying no. I, I think I may disagree with that primarily because it was a reseller. You know, the, 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 the German company should have probably known that if you're buying that much bulk and you're selling it to someone in the United States, it's going to resell it in the United States. Um, I think that might be enough. Uh, in a concurring opinion, Justice Jackson used kind of a similar hypothetical, and she indicated that she thought that that sort of activity would, would be enough, primarily because the, the German infringer, you know, was would have known that it was kind of in bulk sales and would have known that it was going to be resold in the United States. But let's, let's, let's switch it up. What happens if the bag is um, just bought by U.S. tourists um, and brought back to the United States? Um, so you've got you know, a bunch of tourists and, and, and the, the, let's say the, the, the infringer in Germany knows that um, U.S. tourists are going to come by their, their spot. They, they you know, really hope U.S. tourists will come there. Let's let's see what what do people think about that that poll? Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, uh, uh, the majority said that um, it's it's probably not going to be uh, an infringement in U.S. territory, and that's absolutely right. I, I, and in fact, um, uh, Justice Jackson also mentioned this in her concurring opinion that would probably not implicate extraterritorial application of of the Lanham Act. So I think that that uh, everybody's got this one pretty much right. All right, so now we're going to move on to another hypothetical. And this is a little bit more complicated because it deals with services rather than, rather than goods. Um, so in this one, 
um, there's a famous um, casino and, and hotel in Las Vegas called the Palm Dunes. And they had an employee that was maybe high in management and left and went to the Bahamas and decided to build their own hotel in the Bahamas. Um, they only built a single location in the Bahamas, but it's very, very similar to the look and feel of the Las Vegas hotel. Of course, U.S. tourists stay at the, at the resort and, and are confused, assuming that it is related to the Las Vegas hotel. Um, and the Las Vegas hotel sues the former employee for this activity in, in the Bahamas, um, and they sue in Nevada. So the question is, you know, is that going to be proper? And I'm going to give two different fact scenarios and do another couple of polls. What if the former employee actually continues to live in Las Vegas, but just manages the, um, the uh, operations in the Bahamas from there? And what if, you know, uh, the, the resort in the Bahamas actually has like a U.S. office, even though they don't have a resort, they don't have, they're not rendering any service, but they do have a reservation office in the United States. Um, maybe they advertise in some U.S. media um, or maybe have an online gambling website that kind of promotes the, the Bahamas um, resort. What do you, you think under that scenario? What do, you, what do people think um, would happen there? Is that something that, were those facts enough to uh, allow the Nevada court to, um, uh, to enforce U.S. law for activities in Bahamas. So take a few minutes. Hopefully people can can do this um, poll as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It, 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 we got a good uh, result. Everybody's saying it's it, it, it's 100%. I think that's right. Um, those are a lot of activities in the United States. And I think that a Nevada court would probably feel comfortable, and I think the Supreme Court would be comfortable under that scenario. So what about this one? What if... Um, in, you know, let's let's say that there was no residency in, in Nevada, that instead um, all you had was online advertising that was viewable um, from the United States, but not specifically directed at the U.S., you know, but it's got a toll-free number that U.S. consumers can call the Bahamas. Maybe there's some reviews on a U.S. travel website, but that the reviews are not sponsored by the resort, um, although there is confusion in the United States. And reputation harm. Do they, you know, under that scenario where you, you don't have quite as many of the the contacts, um, what do you all think? Um, do we think that that would be enough for the Nevada court to extend um, its reach to Bahamas? Yeah, and, and again, I think we got eighty percent saying no, and I think that's probably the correct answer. Again, you know, these are these sorts of um, situations are always going to be very fact specific. Um, but I, I think you guys are kind of getting the gist of, I think, where the Supreme Court's pointing people toward. So I think, you know, kind of wrapping things up, looking at best practices, if you're a U.S. trademark owner, how should you be thinking in the future after the Abitron decision? And it seems to me like, first, you've got to be prepared to sue uh, foreign defendants, both in U.S. court and in foreign courts. Um, I think Abitron made a mis uh, sorry, Hetronics made a mistake um, uh, only suing in Oklahoma. You, you've got to register your trademarks outside the United States, especially in places where you've got distributors like Abitron was or partners. Um, I would consider, you know, including some sort of contractual provision, you know, if you've got foreign business partners to make um, certain that any IP infringement would be um, a breach of contract. And, um, you know, maybe you also record your trademark registrations with U.S. Customs to keep the foreign infringement out. If you're a U.S. company and you're worried about, you know, not being called to U.S. court, obviously, you know, make sure you have no direct sales in the United States, no online sales in U.S. dollars. Um, and and if, if some U.S. company is buying a big bunch of your products, you might want to think about, you know, are they going to resell them in the United States? Um, you know, just be very careful about where you're advertising, you know, your, your product. Also, you know, if, if you are um, in, in a scheme where you're purchasing parts in the United States, just be wary of that. I'm, I'm not certain whether purchasing parts by itself would, would open you up to it, but if it's kind of like the bull of a situation where they're just kind of trying to avoid making the product in the United States, um, it, maybe it might. Um, so, 
Um, I think those are kind of the, the best practices I, I, to keep us moving. I'm going to go ahead and pass this on to my colleague, Yinfei Wu, to talk about the Jack Daniels case. Take it away, Yinfei. The floor is yours. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Dan. I don't have polls, but I hope at some point of the presentation, Dan can help me uh, entertain the audience by demonstrating the dot toy that I'm about to talk about. So this year, the Supreme Court handed down a short but very important decision um, on the First Amendment's um, implication on, in the trademark, on the trademark cases. So here, respondent VIP, so dog toys that are about the same size and shape of a Jack Daniels whiskey bottle, with the words Jack Daniels replaced with back spaniels, the slogan old number seven brand Tennessee sour mash whiskey swapped for the old number two on your Tennessee carpet and the small print 43% food by volume and 100% smelly replacing 40% alcohol by volume, 80 proof. Not surprisingly, Jack Daniels owns trademarks um, in the words and graphics on its whiskey label and actually a trade dress over its bottle. Justice Kagan actually just called it a distinctive um, bottle. After Jack Daniels um, demanded that VIP stop selling the dog toy, VIP actually sought declaratory judgment in the District Court of Arizona that it neither infringed or diluted the Jack Daniels trademarks. Jack Daniels counterclaimed for infringement and dilution. VIP argued that the threshold Rogers test um, applied or should apply, which would result in the dismissal of the case. Well, just to make sure that we're all complete here, um, Dan, do you want to explain to our audience uh, what is a number two in America? Number two uh, could refer to, uh, in terms of a dog, uh, defecating. Um, so that's that's where the, the, the slang for defecation comes in with respect to the number two that was depicted on the Bad Spaniels bottle. Right, which the court called a humorous message to some extent. Um, so the Rogers test stems from the Second Circuit's ruling in a case involving a film titled Ginger and Fred, which fe featured two um, fictional characters um, imitating actress Ginger Rogers and actor Fred Astaire. So Ginger Rogers actually objected to the use of her name in the title of the film. But the Second Circuit dismissed her case on the grounds that the title was an artistic work that had an expressive element or was an expressive work that was protected by the First Amendment. So the Rogers test states that when a use of a trademark is expressive, there is no trademark infringement unless the use of the mark has no artistic relevance to the underlying work or the use of the mark explicitly misleads as to the source or the content of the work. In this case uh, of the VIP dog toy parody, the district court actually um, held that the Rogers test did not apply because the trademark was being used as a source identifier and apply the standard likelihood of confusion to find infringement and also dilution by tarnishment. However, the Ninth Circuit reversed, holding that the Rogers test applied because the dog toy communicates a humorous message and therefore was an expressive work, which could be diluting Jack Daniels' marks um, for non-commercial use as well. So at the Supreme Court, that's why we're here, or we were in front of the Supreme Court um, that actually again, reversed in, in the short opinion, focusing on whether VIP's use um, of Jack Daniels marks is source identifying the fundamental issue. So on the record, VIP actually conceded that I used the Bax Daniels marks and the trade dress um, over the, the shape and, and the look appearance of the um, toy as a source identifiers. 
Therefore, the court held that first on infringement, the Rogers test does not apply because VIP was using the trademark as a source identifier for its own dog toys. Similarly, for dilution, the court held that the non-commercial exclusion does not shield parity or other commentary when VIP's use of the marks is source identifying and therefore commercial. This holding um, will certainly shift the focus in cases where parody or commentary is involved um, to whether the challenged use of a term or graphics or trade dress um, qualifies as source identifying. For the Supreme Court, the determination in this case was straightforward because VIP conceded. There was no dispute that VIP used Bax Daniels um, as a trademark. Um, in fact, as we just talked about, VIP repeatedly claimed trademark rights and trade dress rights in the Bax Daniel Spaniels um, name and product design. And, and also marketed the Back Spaniels mark opposite its trademarked um, Silly Squeakers logo, referring to the toys being chewable and uh, squeaky um, on its hand tag. Um, but not every case will be so clear on this factor. Um, and in the next several slides, we'll see how courts um, look at the complaints to find if there are or were um, sufficient facts on the source identifying factor post Jack Daniels. So in this case, the JTH Tax LLC versus AMC Networks Inc. Actually, um, the caption was so long Sony um, was also a defendant, um, but was dropped from our title. Apologies. Um, so for those who are not um, familiar with the, the plaintiff's um, company name, JTH Tax LLC, I'm sure you've seen uh, the Liberty Tax Services, which is their house mark and the red, white, blue motif and the statue Liberty sculptures and sometimes, a lot of times, the inflatables that they use off the highways and streets uh, across its more than 200, I'm sorry, 2,500 offices in the United States for tax preparation services. The defendants, AMC Networks and Sony Pictures Televisions, are the creators of the crime drama Better Call Saul. In the show, as shown on, at the bottom of the slide, um, so the Battle Call Saul um, had this like fictional shady tax firm, Sweet Liberty Tax Services, that um, resembled the plaintiff's um, tax preparation offices in, in one episode of the show. So the judge um, in Manhattan actually ruled in favor of AMC and Sony, um, saying that they um, they did not use the plaintiff's trademarks as trademarks to identify sources. Rather, uh, the defendants used the Sweet Liberty tax services to advance the plot, not for marketing purposes, or to disparage the plaintiff. The judge also discussed the um, Jack Daniels case and, and recognized that the Rogers test does not apply as Justice Kagan wrote for the court, for the Supreme Court, um, that when an alleged infringer uses a trademark as a designation uh, or identifying sort, uh, identifier um, of source for the infringers on goods, um, but the Rogers test still applies, um, like when, like like in this case, when um, the alleged infringer is not using the challenged mark um, as as a trademark. Here, um, it is an expressive work in the show, and 
the AMC networks and Sony used it not in a source identifying manner as um, shown in the photos here. Um, they, on, on the complaint, there is simply no facts pointing to you know, either a, a product or a service like a tax preparation service or a counseling service offered by AMC or Sony under the Sweet Liberty tax um, mark. And also um, in, in, in any, um, in, in, the, in the complaint, there were no, uh, no facts um, alleged surrounding the, you know, marketing or promotional activities um, proffered by the defendants um, that even remotely pointed to trademark use in, in the United States. The next case is the Home Investors of America versus Warner Brothers Discovery. So Warner Brothers Discovery um, was hit by this trademark infringement suit in the District Court of Delaware for its HGTV series, Ugliest House in America. The plaintiff, a Home Investors of America, Again, you may not recognize the, the name, the company name as a plaintiff, but I'm sure you um, probably saw some of their um, ads, especially on billboards, um, as shown on this slide at the bottom, um, with the slogan, we buy ugly houses. And also um, for every year they, they have these, um, mark or, or slogan used for the contest for the ugliest house of the year. So these two marks were asserted by the plaintiff for infringement and, and dilution as well against Warner Brothers um, Discovery. So Judge Hatcher also compared this case uh, with Jack, that Jack Daniels case in denying um, Warner Brothers Discovery's 12B6 motion to dismiss, pointing out that the plaintiffs actually pled sufficient facts in the amended complaint that uh, Warner Brothers Discovery used the term ugliest house in America in a source identifying manner. So here you can see those are the facts uh, that were pled by the plaintiff in the in the amended complaint. Both parties ran a test, co contests related to ugly homes. And if you do internet searches um, for home investors' marks, you get results um, for the defendant's show. Um, the defendants had promotional materials um, for the show emphasizing the marks and they also, either by themselves or through their agents, um, sought to take advantage of the consumer recognition. Pointing back to Jack Daniels' um, decision where Justice Kagan really uh, explained that you know, one, one of Trademark's um, primary function is to reap um, financial rewards or gains and consumer recognition by through, through the trademark usage. And also uh, the defendant was actively competing with the plaintiff in the franchising field for houses and homeowners. So the judge denied the motion to dismiss and allowed the suit to continue. Our final case um, post Jack Daniels um, is um, or, or relates to the NFT or metaverse, uh, which is also very fun and new um, to, to our today's practice. So in this case, um, the Hermes um, company, the luxury um, fashion company that um, is known for the Birkins bags, uh, sued an individual whose last name is Rothschild. Um, this 
individual created these NFTs uh, in Metaverse that resembled the Birkenstock um, and also had a website named metaberkins.com. Uh, he labeled these M NFTs with Meta Birkins and, refer you know, obviously offered them and sold them um, in, in, in the metaverse to the American consumers. Hermes obviously registered the Birkins trademarks and, uh, you know, really invested a lot in promoting its famous Birkins um, bag um, to achieve its distinctive uh, trade dress recognition. So in this case, the judge explained that Rothschild, the defendant, did exactly what Lanham Act most, most uh, cared about, which is the use of a term or a trademark or trade dress, the product design, et cetera, as a designation of source for Rothschild's products. The interesting part of this case really is that Rothschild actually argued that he had a disclaimer right by his product listing that metal Birkins are artworks uh, ringing the expressive work term again by Mason Rothschild, which is the full name of the defendant here, are not affiliated with or endorsed or sponsored by Hermes. Um, the court um, pointed back to the Jack da Daniels decision and simply rejected that argument that the disclaimer should be sufficient to avoid or prevent any consumer conflict confusion. So this is a really good reminder to, to keep um, because in, we understand that in some uh, jurisdictions uh, outside of the United States, disclaimers can be a factor that tips the scale of um, actual confusion or likelihood of confusion towards non-infringement, but it is not likely to succeed in these cases in the United States. Thank you. I will um, conclude my part of the um, presentation and to turn the floor back to Brett. Thank you, Yinfei. Um, now we're gonna be switching gears and talking about copyright law. So the other ones we were talking about were uh, landmark trademark decisions. There was a copyright decision this year, which was Andy Warhol Foundation for, uh, for the Visual Arts versus Goldsmith. And it deals with the question of copyright fair use. Um, so under US law, what is fair use? Well, it's a defense against a copyright infringement claim that tries to kind of balance um, you know, the rights of the copyright holder versus maybe some public interest of other um, artists or, uh, or uh, participants in expressive conduct. Um, the, the, there are four factors in determining whether a second work that copies an earlier one is considered fair use and therefore non-infringing. Um, we're going to focus today primarily on the first factor, the purpose and character of the work um, that is copied, the, 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 sorry, the copying work, the second work. What is the purpose and character of that work? The other factors are the nature of the original work, the amount uh, or portion that's taken, and the effect on the potential marketing of the original author's work. So the central question for this first factor, um, is the secondary work a substitution for the original work, which weighs against fair use, meaning like would it kind of compete with it, you'd buy that work instead of the original work, or is it transformative, meaning that it has some additional or purpose or different character, and that would favor the fair use defense. You know, it, one way of looking at it is, is what is transformative? It's when you take the original work and the second work transforms it into something else, kind of like the caterpillar becomes the, the butterfly. Now, we want to distinguish that sort of transformative work versus simply uh, adapting the original work for a derivative work. So, for example, in Harry Potter world, it's not a transformative to take the book 
and turn it into a movie or a musical or translate it into a different language. Those are just derivative works from the original and not transformative under the fair use test. So, so with that background, what are the facts of the Warhol versus Goldsmith case? Well, first off, who's the plaintiff, Lynn Goldsmith? Well, she was um, for many, many decades, a trailblazing rock and roll photographer. She took photographs of famous rock and roll legends um, as they were performing in their private life, et cetera. And she took uh, a bunch of pictures of you know, the artist formerly known as Prince, or at the time that she took the picture, he was still called Prince. Um, so then who's Andy Warhol? Many of you may know Andy Warhol much more. He's much more famous. Of course, you know, a major American pop artist. He would take everyday items, soup cans, you know, photographs of famous celebrities and, you know, change them around to make them kind of this pop art that has a statement. And he would, uh, has whole series of silkscreen portraits of important figures. So going back in time, back in 1984, Goldsmith had um, taken photographs of prints and um, Vanity Fair wanted Andy Warhol to create a unique piece of art for Vanity Fair um, and it was going to cover Prince's fame. And Goldsmith granted a license to Vanity Fair, not Andy Warhol, to allow them to use it as source art for someone else to create something for their magazine. Um, Warhol did that. He created this, this painting here for the, the magazine. But he also created 15 other different silkscreen prints um, or different silkscreen works of art of the Prince series. I um, mean, he, he did that without Goldsmith's um, license. So we fast forward 32 years, and the Andy Warhol Foundation owns um, the, the the Prince series. Andy Warhol Foundation, um, you know, took over the protection of Andy Warhol's art after he passed away. Um, Condé Nast, Vanity Fair's parent, um, wanted um, to use one of Andy Warhol's prints on a commemorative issue after Prince's death. Um, but at this point in time, Goldsmith was not paid or credited. And you'll notice it's a different painting from the original one that um, was in Vanity Fair. Now, all the while that this was going on, um, Goldsmith had been licensing her photographs of Prince to other publications, including the musician uh, magazine. So she was making money off of these photographs still. So when um, uh, Goldsmith sued Andy Warhol, she's claiming it's copyright infringement. It's the, it's the same um, piece of art that they've copied <coughs> and it's beyond the license that she originally gave for that one appearance. The Andy Warhol Foundation said, oh, it's fair use because they've transformed it. They've, you know, Andy Warhol created this new art, this new work of art, and it has new expression, new creative expression. So it's, so it is transformed. Um, yeah, so I, again, I already said that the, the main point is that this new, this painting had a different meaning or message from the original photograph that Goldsmith had made. Um, the Supreme Court ultimately disagreed with Andy Warhol, saying that it really wasn't transformative enough. Although it clearly had some new expression, they were really kind of the same thing, right? Um, Goldsmith's photo, you know, was intended to be licensed for publications. It appeared in magazines. The same was true of the original Andy Warhol art piece, and the same was true of the second one that was used in, in Vanity Fair. Um, and so, you know, the, 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 you know the, the, this wasn't really transformative enough since it was, you know, the same photograph um, and used in the same manner for, for magazines. So even though Orange Prince, that was the title of the, the work of art, did have some new expression, it was really the same purpose and the same commercial licensing, which weighed against fair use. So with that background, um, we're going to do some hypotheticals and some polls about what you think would be transformative. And they're all kind of be based around the same um, uh, central facts. So there's a novelist that has a best-selling book about a treasure hunter, a series of, of books about this treasure hunter that has 
um, Adventures in the Rainforest. Um, and our first fact scenario is the, the novelist finds that some studio, without her permission, has taken the novel and created a movie um, version of it with the same plot, same characters. And so the question for you all is, is that transformative? All right, so yeah, it looks like the majority is saying that it is not transformative, and I completely agree. I, I think that that is really more of a derivative work. Um, it's not transformative, so it wouldn't really fall within, within fair use. It would be something that would be a derivative work that they would have to get a license and permission to do. And I, you know, we, we, we think that, that that's pretty, pretty clear. Um, let me just go ahead and go on to the next one. So here's a, a, our, our next um, fact scenario. So what happens, it's the same novelist, same, same book, but instead an educational company creates a video to teach children um, about, um, ab uh, about um, environments and different environmental issues, particularly relating to the Amazon. It's sold to, to school children. Um, and um, one video about the Amazon has the treasure hunter character and the, the character discusses the ecosystem of the rainforest. Um, so it doesn't include the, the plot, um, it just has the, the character. So the question is in that kind of educational setting, is it transformative? So we'll give everybody a, a few minutes to, to think about this. Let's see if we've given people enough time. And so 80% are saying yes, 20% are saying no. And I, I think it's a close case. Um, I do think it possibly may be transformative. Certainly, you know, educating children um, is something different from the, the novel. Um, I think the question is whether or not, you know, how extensively is the the character used in the educational materials. Um, the, the mere fact that it's educational by itself may not be enough. So if you know the, uh, the video kind of too slavishly followed the, uh, the book or um, included um, too much, that might not be fair use. Uh, but I, I do think there's a decent argument that this would be transformative. So now we're going for our last hypothetical. Um, so in this case, again, we've got the same novelist, the same um, copyrighted um, book about the, the treasure hunter in the Amazon. But instead, it, this one, we've got um, a, a playwright or a screenwriter that creates a musical about the novelist, not necessarily about the, uh, the series of books or the treasure hunter, but about the novelist. And in one scene, the treasure hunter character shows up in a, in a way to kind of talk about what the novelist was thinking while inventing the, the treasure hunter. And so the question is kind of with that background, would, would it be transformative? And again, we've got our, our poll and we'll give everybody a little bit of time here. a little bit more time. And everybody says it's transformative and I completely agree. It, it, it is transformative. In fact, that is loosely based on a real case from back in 2013, the Sofa Entertainment versus Dodger Products. Really, you know, the, the, the Treasure Hunter character is just there as a theatrical device. Um, so I think there's, there's really no question that, um, that that is transformative and that would be fair use. So I think we've got a few minutes. Um, well, I'll, I'll, the, I think the, the, the key takeaway here is, you know, although adding some new expression like Andy Warhol did um, is part of the transformative um, test, it's not the only thing. Um, and so there needs to be probably more um, differences than just adding a little bit of expression even if it's artistic in nature. And I think, you know, we're, we're kind of running up against time. So I want to open it up for questions. I'm going to turn it back over to Dan 
and allow him to kind of moderate some of our questions. Thanks, Brent. Um, yeah, just wanted to quickly mention before we begin the question and answer portion of the event, if you could please take a moment to complete uh, a brief evaluation survey. Um, we strive to provide programs of value and continually improve. So we would appreciate your input, which would guide us in planning future programs. Um, so now, uh, as Brett said, it's, uh, it's time to address questions from the audience. Um, as a reminder to participate or ask a question, um, in the Q&A, just go ahead and click on the Q&A button and type your question in the Q&A window and then click submit. Um, so while we might be getting a, a few questions here towards the end, um, we had some submissions during the actual presentation uh, and I was just going to go ahead and um, uh, ask them to our panelists. Um, the first question, Brett, is for you uh, regarding the Abitron case. Um, and the question is, uh, should a foreign producer wishing, wish, wishing to sell to a U.S. customer but wanting to avoid an accusation of infringing conduct in U.S. territory only deliver to a U.S. customer's foreign office, even if knowing that the product will end up in the U.S.? Does it make any difference where the sales contract is negotiated? I think that's an excellent question. I mean, I, I think that Again, it's going to depend on the facts of, of each case. If there's some something like what we saw in the Steel versus Bull of a case where it's kind of a ruse to get around um, uh, something going on in the United States, it might be um, still enough to um, you know to Im Im make a court think it could apply extraterritorially. But I do think you know if you know, if it's part of an overall plan to just meticulously avoid any contacts with the United States um, and, you know, all of the um, products are made outside the United States, they're advertised at the United States, there's no um, entering the United States for advertising purposes, they haven't like somehow lured a U.S. company into this agreement um, and then are using um, the, the foreign office as a way to... Um, to avoid it, um, I, I think it probably would not be subject to a U.S. court. But mm -hmm. if there if there is somehow some um, reaching out to the U.S. Um, to conclude the sale, um, I, I think there might be a risk there. But I think it's a close call. I think it's a very close call. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I think that looks like the only Abitron question that we had. Um, the next question is uh, regards to Jack Daniels case. Um, this would be for Yin Fei. Um, Yin Fei, uh, the question is, what types of facts would a plaintiff need to plead in a complaint to allege trademark use after Jack Daniels? That's a that's an awesome question. Meaning that the audience is is really listening. Um, so for the facts, it really it really goes back to what constitutes trademark use in the United States, right? For your products, you affixate your trademark um, on the product that is um, sold or transported across state lines and or um, between countries uh, or at least um, you know, across it, in, in a channel where the com Congress can regulate. For example, if you source a certain products and have them, um, and source them in, in China, for example, often, and the brand owner sells it to the United States, um, that that is that is trademark use. And you, you just have to please facts surrounding you know, how you use that trademark on your product. Service-wise, it's also um, similar. Um, you, you offered a service um, to consumers in the United States um, and uh, have your um, trademark um, be displayed or um, asphyxiated um, in close proximity to your services. Um, especially the description um, of your services. So, um, you know, when we when we talked about the three cases, the following 
Jack Daniels, you can see how the judges are really looking at what um, factual elements um, the plaintiff has pled in the complaint. And you always have the chances um, to amend the complaint um, and, and, and plead more facts if available. Um, and, and let's back up a little bit for companies in, that do not wish to get into um, disputes or litigation. You also want to keep a record on how you use the mark um, or the term, either in a trademark um, source identifying manner or um, fair use or non-trademark, non-commercial manner. Great. Yeah, that's, and I think we have time for one more question. Um, Brad, this regards uh, uh, the Andy Warhol case. Um, is it sufficiently transformative for fair use if a supermarket chain recreates a famous photo in food products for its advertising? Is there enough new expression? <laughs> that's That sounds very creative, and it certainly is an artistic expression. Um, I guess um, my thought is that that would probably be um, probably a, somewhat of a close call, but I'd probably come down on the side of it not being fair use because it's being used as a commercial, right? It's a it's a supermarket trying to sell itself, and um, you know there, although there is some kind of transformative element, and maybe that might even meet, you know, part of that that first factor. It's still probably commercial use, you know, not some sort of a non-commercial use like we saw with the, um, the, the artistic um, film writer that, that, that was talking about the novelist. Um, so I think that it probably would be, um, you know, be, be a tough one. Okay, let's see, I think. We actually just got one last question that came in. It looks like a copyright question here. Um, and the question is, uh, an author writes a novel and includes some lyrics of songs as part of the story. For example, the character walks into a bar and he sings a sentence of the song that the jukebox was playing. The author identifies the author of the song. Is the use of the lyrics in the novel transformative and thus fair use? Yeah, I think that one would be transformative. That's, that's a, I think, a bit of an easier one because, you know, the, the, it's the novelist is not kind of replacing the song. Instead, they're actually really transforming the song as to an, you know, a plot element or a setting element for, for the novel. So I, to me, that seems like a really good example of transformative fair use. Hmm. Okay, and I think, yeah, it, it looks like we're all, we're all done with our questions. Um, nothing else in the queue. So I, I just wanna thank everyone for attending today's webcast implications of the U.S. Supreme Court's 2023 decisions for trademark and copyright owners. Um, this presentation will be available on demand in the next week. So please look for an email from us with the access link. This concludes today's Finnegan webcast. Uh, we thank you for participating.